Hello. Our problem today is figuring out how, if we're given two variables, uh, one may be indicating in our example uh, some level of results from different treatments that we give, and the other variable uh, relating the different kinds of treatments that we give, so they're both categorical. How can we tell um, statistically if our choices with one of the variables has any effect on the choice, or not the choice, but what comes of the other variable? So maybe in our example, we're going to look at uh, two different types of treatment for something called carpal tunnel syndrome, and, we're, and we have three different possibilities of results. The question is, is does our choice of treatment affect uh, what kind of results that we get? Or are they independent? Now, when we say independent, we mean it in a mathematical sense that, um, that one can happen um, without uh, having any, that one can, ha how, whether or not one happens has nothing to do with whether or not another one happens. Some other value occurs on the other variable. And if we think that a treatment, that one treatment is better than another in pushing towards maybe a, a something, uh, maybe better results or worse results, then they won't be independent. The two variables will be dependent. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do an example and um, see how it goes. So let's start with this. So in our problem here, uh, we've got our trusty uh, Excel, and we've got two variables, and we're always going to have two variables, but how many different things that can occur, they're both categorical, and how many different results that we can have for each one is important. And so I'm going to shift it up from a little bit than we did in class, just so that you can see that these numbers can change a bit. So suppose we have two different methods for treating carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's a a disease that you get, uh, it's a breaking down or inflammation in the, the wrist, often from typing or doing things with your wrists that uh, is unnatural, or putting them in long-term stress situations that we might find in work. And we have, um, we have two different treatments that we can have for this. So that will be what we call, that's our treatment variable, but in this case, because of how we put them in something called uh, a contingency table, we'll call it our row variable, and there's two possibilities, a wrist brace or surgery. So those are our two treatments. Those are two possibilities for our treatment variable or our row variable. Now, let's say that there are three possible outcomes or results, and that will be our column variable. Let's say that you can either cure it, or there's no change, or it actually worsens. Now, of course, the, the there could be lots of different things that happen. We may even have to face the issue of discretizing a whole continuum of possibilities. But right now, let's just say there's three different outcomes. Okay? Okay. So I've put some more information on here. I've actually included the contingency table of data that we're going to be using just so that you have a frame of reference of what I'm talking about instead of it coming as a surprise at the end. So as I said, we have uh, a treatment variable with two different possible values. Either we use a brace or we use surgery. And we have, we're going to say we have three different possible outcomes for the results. Uh, a cure, no change, or it worsens. All right. One of the things that we're going to need when we get down to the mechanics of comparing our test st statistic to a um, critical score is we're going to need to use a distribution that requires a degree of freedom. Now, we're not going to use the t distribution. We're going to use something called the chi-squared distribution. And the chi-squared distribution does, to know which one of the distributions we're using, we do need to know uh, degree of freedom. Now, the way to compute the degree of freedom for contingency tables is the number of row values minus 1 times the number of column values minus 1. So here, we have two possible row values, and we have three possible um, column values. 
and so to and notice I've wrote the the formula right here but you'll have to put that in or you could just put the number in either one um, just to get practice on doing our formulas we need practice 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 all right there we go and it comes out to be two if we had a two by two table two possible values for each variable our degree of freedom would be one and that's what the smaller problems that we see in the text but this one's a little bit bigger so that we can see what happens this is the primary thing that changes now we form our null and our alternative hypothesis so for this whole set of possible uh, problems the null and the alternative hypothesis are basically the same we could word them in terms of the specific problem but uh, behind the scenes there they are the same thing and that is the null hypothesis is is that the um, the the treatments in this case like the treatment uh, has no effect is independent their choice of treatment is independent not no effect but is independent from the uh, outcomes so whether we use the brace or the surgery the probability of each of the outcomes will be the same they're independent of each other okay so the row variable and the column variable values are independent of each other and what our alternative hypothesis is each and every time is that they're not independent of each other and so what we're going to assume is we're going to go back to some of our probability and assume that they are independent of each other calculate a specific single statistic number compare it to a critical score and see is it highly unlikely that we would get that number or is it pretty likely that we would get a number like that if it's highly unlikely if our test statistic goes past our critical score we'll reject the null hypothesis and this is what we do time and time again we check to see if the single test statistic that we calculate is it very unlikely for it or something more extreme to happen given the null hypothesis do we reject that null hypothesis and say this is just too freaky we're going to reject this null hypothesis for the alternative okay so this is our data here but remember before we actually take this data we'd have a little bit more work we need to decide what our significance level will be so it's usually 0.05 or 0.01 just they're pretty straightforward you can have something smaller if we were in physics or if we're in the social sciences or education we may take something bigger but it's something we need to decide before we take the data so that we don't hedge our bets later and go oh well we meant 0.05 or something like that you can always tell these test statistics and tell the p-value so that other people can make their own decision if it's worthwhile to do this experiment again with maybe with uh, with a larger total sample size okay so our significance level I'm gonna put at 0 0.01 now the chi-square distribution is not a symmetric distribution so it, it starts at 0 and it it goes up and then it goes back down on the tail and what we want is we want to know what the critical score is in our chi-square distribution such that the remaining area is 0 0.01 if our significance level was 0 0.05 we would want the remaining area on the tail on the right hand side to be 0 0.05 now how do we compute that well I wrote the uh, formula right here so instead of a t dot inverse or a norm dot inverse we're going to use a chi squared so c h i s q so we'll type this in chi squared dot i n v and then we put in the probability that's to the left it's always for excel you're always putting in the probability that's to the left and in this case you you tell it the degree of freedom now if the probability on the right of the tail is 0.01 then we need to subtract that from one to get the how much area to the left so we go equals chi square dot inv parentheses so it's going to be one minus this significance level that way if we change our significance level it will automatically change um, what the critical score is and our degrees of freedom which we calculate right here and we end that boom
okay? So 9.21034, now that's a much bigger number than we're used to. So in chi-squared, you can get some pretty big critical scores and pretty big uh, test statistics. So don't interpret them the same way. I mean, that would be a huge critical score if we were dealing with a t-distribution or a uh, standard normal distribution. That would mean 9.2 standard deviations from away from the mean, which is just like way out there, but that's not what's going on here. So when we compute our test statistic, we need it, if we want to reject the null hypothesis, we will do it if our test statistic is bigger than that number, bigger than 9.2, okay? So what we've got here is this data, and uh, it's time to start working with it, okay? So we're going to be calculating probability. So the first thing we want to do is actually get some uh, subtotals. So this is talking about, of the people who used a brace, how many got a cure, how many didn't change, and how many got worse. And we want to, to know the total number of people who used a brace. And spreadsheets are great at this. So we can just say equals sum. And then we don't even have to, we could just put this plus this plus this, but this is a way of doing it quickly. And once you learn this technique, you can do sums over large sets of data. So we can just select all of this, and that will sum up that row. And no, it, it goes from C15 colon E15. So it says add up everything from C15 to E15. We close the parentheses and hit enter. So there were 174 people that were treated with a brace. Now we can do the same thing with uh, surgery. So we're going to sum up all three of these. And so there were 87 people who were treated with surgery. Now we can sum up 174 and 87 to get the total number of people that were in this, um, in this data. So we can go sum and this select these two numbers. 261. Now here's the thing about the contingency p uh, table. No, no one of these people are in more than one square. So instead of adding these two up and getting 261, we could have done this, equals sum, and we could have said add up all of these six squares. And notice, again, we get 261. Finally, we want, so this tells me the subtotals of people who got the, the uh, for the different rows. We want the subtotals for the different columns also. So we've got uh, equal sum of these two. And, and we could have just, we could do something like this. We could say equals uh, this value plus this value and be done. It's just, it's nice to go ahead and get used to using such a often used command like sum. And then finally, and we could actually copy this formula over and notice that it it copies the relative addresses over and gives me the addresses for those. Or we could type in the command. So 151 plus 80 is 231 plus another 30 is 261. So it adds up this way also. Okay? Now, we've got those subtotals. What we want to do is compute some probabilities, okay? But um, it, it's a little stretch of what we're actually going about computing. So I'm going to go to the next stage and show you the formula we're using, and then I'm going to explain it to you and remind you that in the text you also have this exp you also have written out an explanation. And so if you combine my verbal explanation with what you've read, that should give you a nice foundation of what's going on, okay? So let's go to our next. So what we got here, we got everything that we had last time, except I've kind of copied in, I've put in a little formula here, and I've recopied the, uh, the headings for my table here. Because I'm going to make a new table, and then I'm going to make one more table. And maybe the easiest way of doing that is just copying all of this and just doing a control copy, and then clicking here and doing uh, a control paste and you'll just get everything here, and then you can type in new formulas there. But what do we want to do? Well, we want to calculate, remember, we've got to use our null hypothesis, so we want to assume the null hypothesis, that the 
random that random huh, that the result variable the row uh, the column variable and the row variable the treatment variable are independent of each other so if I asked you what is the probability that you would get a brace and that would actually cure you then if they were independent and this is a, a, a theorem out of probability theory that if two events are independent of each other then getting the probability of both of them happening at the same time is just a matter of multiplying the two probabilities together now if they're not independent that doesn't work out but if they are independent then you can get the probability of both of them happening by just multiplying together the 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 probability of each one happening so kind of as a uh, a uh, as a small like half step to this I'll show you what I'm talking about so here we could say okay what is the probability that uh, I would get a a brace okay what is the probability that I would get a brace well um, the brace is 174. There was 174 people that got a brace out of the 261 people that were in this study. So the probability of getting a brace is 174. If I just selected someone randomly, what's the probability that they would be the, a person who got a brace? Would be 174 divided by 261. Okay? Now, I want to multiply that. What is the probability that someone in this study was cured well the total number of people that were cured was 151 and the total number of people in this study was, was 261 so we have 261 i'm sorry 151 151 that's this value right here divided by 261 now, if I hit enter, what do I get? So this says that if these two variables are independent, then the probability of getting a brace and being cured should be 0.38 or 0.39. So about 38.6% chance of happening by just looking at the total number of people that got a cure, the total number of people that got a brace, and the total number of people in the whole study. So the probability of getting a, a brace and being cured, if these two variables are independent, is 0 0.385696, on and on and on. Now, if that's the probability of getting a brace and getting a cure, then we can think of that as a relative frequency that 38.5696% of the time, this is what happens. People will get a brace and get a cure. So if we turn around and multiply that times the total number of people in this study, then we can get the expected number of people who got a brace and were cured. So if I take this number, let me double click in here so, and then I turn around and say, okay, now let's multiply this by the total number of people in the study. So this is the probability of getting uh, a brace. This is the probability of getting a cure. If I multiply this by the total number of people in the study, then by the assumption of independence, this will tell me how many people I expected to get a brace and be cured. Now notice, this is not equal to the actual number of people who got a brace and got cured. Because there may not be pure independence here. But if these were purely independent events, then this number, the expected number of people who got a brace and were cured, should be very close to the actual number who got a brace and who were cured. Now, what we're interested in is actually looking at a kind of a, a little higher level arithmetic version of this minus this. Because I see that there's a little less than five people. There's 
a little less than five, well, a little more than uh, a difference of five between what we expect to happen, just looking purely at the independent probabilities and what actually did happen, all right? And we're trying to figure out if what actually, if this difference between what we expect to happen and what did happen, if it's extremely unlikely, then we may reject the idea that these probabilities are independent. That's what's going on. If we find a huge discrepancy between what actually happened and what should have happened, given that the two variables are independent, then we will go, oh, that is so unlikely that my original assumption of independence must be wrong, and I will reject the null hypothesis. Now, what I want to do is compute that for all six of these situations, okay? Now, I'm not just going to add them all together because I'll actually show you what's going to happen there, but I'm going to compute each one of these six situations. Now, you may have noticed I typed those numbers in, but what I really want to do is click on the addresses. Okay, so let's try this again. Remember, that's 100.66, so I want equals. Now, let's watch what happens. I want equals um, the total number of people who got a brace divided by the total number of people times the total number of people who got a cure. Whoops, I need a parenthesis there, don't I? The total number of people I got a cure divided by the total number of people who got, who were in this study. So that is my independent probability. That's the probability of getting a brace and being cured if these two variables were completely independent. Then I'm going to multiply this, 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 this relative frequency, this percentage, this probability, times the total number of people to get the expected number of people that should have gotten a brace and were cured using those probabilities. So I go times this right here. And what do I get? 100.667. Now, I'm going to walk in and do a couple of more of those, but I'm going to show you something uh, that could make this a little bit easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this equation up here. I'm not going to just copy this thing around. I'm going to copy that equation and keep pasting it in and then changing whatever I need to change. So I'm going to copy that equation. So I'm copying the actual written part, not the cell. So I don't just click on here and copy the cell. I'm going to copy what's inside the cell. Another way of doing this is double clicking on the cell and then selecting everything in there and doing a control C. Okay? And then escaping out. Now, let's click right here. And if I'm in that cell and then I paste it in, this thing, notice it highlights what I'm doing. But what I want is I want the total number of no change, not the number of people that have a cure. Now, I could go in here and type in the address for this, or I could select this address, double-click on it, and select right here, and that would change that. And see how nice that is? And then I hit Enter. And so the expected number of people to get a brace and have no change is 53.3. Now, let's do that again. I'm going to keep that same, so I'm going to double-click in there, and then I'm just going to paste that formula in there. But now I'm going to use my favorite way of changing things. It's a very kind of a visual, tactile way. So there's the total number of people that are a brace. And that, I still want that number. There's my total, total number of people in the whole study. But I want this column, the number of people that worsen. And what I'm getting is the number of people that cure. Well, one of the things I can do is just click and hold on the boundary of this and just move it over. And notice it changes the, I, I see the new coloring and everything. Boom. So let's do that again. So I double click into here. Paste that formula in. Now I do want the number of people that were cured, but I want the probability of them having surgery. So I just move this blue one down and it changes the address there. So I'm grabbing the boundary, not at the corner, but just along the boundary and pulling it to another spot. But whatever you like is fine with me. So here I want, um, I want surgery and I want no change. So I'm going to move this one over here and I'm going to move this one down. 
like that. And then finally, I'll paste that in. And so I want the number, and I double click on that, I want the number of people that got worse and who had surgery, and then boom. So what I have here uh, is a list of all of, if these two variables are independent, then this is the list of all the expected numbers I would have gotten. Now, I want to show you that, let's just do a sum across here, sum of these three. Can you guess what you think you would get? You still get 174. So it keeps the totals the same, right? And if I copy this down, just grabbing that and pulling it down, notice it's also 87, right? And then if I go equals the sum, you can probably guess that all these totals are going to be the same. And then if I just copy this over, boom. And actually, if I copy one more, I'll get my total. Okay? So what we've got here is this is the actual data, and this is the expected data from that. All right. So now we want to see how much difference is there between the expected data and the virtual data. So let's talk about that. So I have a new sheet here where I've made another table, another place for a table, and I put in another formula here. And so this, this may look complicated, but it's the same thing computed every time. And if you look at it, there's some things in there that make sense. Uh, they echo some things you've already seen. So first of all, I am trying to measure the error between what actually happened and what is expected to happen if my variables are independent. That's the thing that we're assuming to be true. That's the thing we're seeing. So what are we doing? We're going to compute a, we want to compute a single statistic that holds in it the information of whether or not of the difference between what did happen and what should have happened given our null hypothesis. In that single statistic, we want to know what the distribution of it is. We want a central limit theorem for that statistic that says, oh, guess what? If you compute this thing and this, and this thing holds and this thing holds and maybe some other things, then its distribution will be, and maybe it's a normal distribution, maybe it's a T distribution, but in our case, and it's one of the reasons why this looks a little strange. In our case, we're, we're shooting for something that's called the chi-squared distribution. That if we don't just take the differences, but if we take the differences and square them, and then divide through by the expected value to get kind of a relative error, kind of a, a relative squared error, then, and then add those together, we get something that has what's called a chi-squared distribution one of our lovely favorite distributions. You've never heard of it before, but it's got a picture and we can calculate things either using Excel or using a table. It does, with, with technology, it doesn't matter. If we can figure out what the distribution for something is, we can play this game all over again. Now, how do we get that single test statistic? Well, you've got to do this. So the O is the observed value. The E is the expected value. You square that and then divide by the expected value. Now, taking something, the observed, minus the expected over the expected, that would be um, very much a relative error. We have talked about that in, in lots of situations. Observed minus expected over expected. Or new minus old over old was percentage changed. However, if you add all those up in this, then your pluses and your minuses cancel out and you'll end up with zero every time. In some places, if it goes up, then other places it has to go down. And we can see that that's why these numbers still come out and add up to the same thing as they did before. So one way of thinking about it is that this squaring serendipitously uh, forces everything to be positive and not add up to be zero. But that's not really what's going on. What's going on is, remember, even back to the standard deviation, 
we're going to take these values that we square and we're going to add them up. And we know that the sum of the squares is a way that we fundamentally get at measures of distance. That it's a Pythagorean theorem kind of thing that in calculus and in statistics, to be able to do some fundamental calculus on these things, we often want to go down that route of not taking absolute values or not just making them positive when they're negative or anything like that, which is the same thing as absolute values. What we want to do is square them and then add them up. Okay, so the idea here, and then that's exactly what happens. The math comes through and says, oh, we know what the distribution of this is. So for each of these, what we want to do, and we have to be careful because we're going to need two sets of parentheses. So we're going to put in two sets of parentheses. So what we want is the observed people who got a brace and were cured minus the expected number of people who got a brace and were cured. We want to square that, and the way to do that in Excel is to put this little hat that's on the 6 key, that's above the 6 key, and put a 2. And then you want to put in another parentheses because we're going to take that whole squared thing and make it relative by dividing by the expected. Boom. Right there's the expected. Okay? Just look at that for a second. So the observed minus the expected squared and then divided by the expected to make it relative. And we want to do that for each one of these six different scenarios. So not very big difference at all. Now, the way we've set this up is I can copy this across, and all these things will match up, and Excel will do a good job of sliding everything over by the same amount, and I'll get the same number every time. So first of all, I'm just going to copy this down. And then I'm going to copy. I, what I'm doing is I am grabbing. You can either just select it, do a control C to copy. Notice the dotted line. And then just click over here and paste. 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 That's one way of doing it. Or you can select and then go in the corner until you see that solid plus sign. And that says if you grab and pull, it will automatically doing paste. So I can paste it down and well, I can paste it down and then come down here again and grab it and pull it over. And notice I get those same numbers. Now I just want to show you, let's double click in here and show you that I am still getting, let's just move that. I am still getting the equation where it is this value, the surgery that got worse people, minus the expected number of people that had surgery and got worse, squared, all divided by the expected number of people who got worse. So if we had just typed in that formula for each one of these, we get exactly this. So we're good to go. Now what do we want to do? Well, each of these is a measure of relative change. It's the square at the top, so it's slightly different. But what we gain from that, from the inability to be able to say exactly what it is, what we gain from that is, is that we know mathematics tells us, there's a nice theorem somewhere that tells us that, hey, this thing, when you go through and square all these and compute the relative value, you're getting something that is chi-square distributed. Which means that I want to add all of these up. And how do I do that? Where well, I can add across the row and then add down at the column, or I could just go sum. Come on. I don't know why. Sum, parentheses, and then just select all six of these. And it gives me the I address from uh, I15 to K16. Close that parentheses and hit enter. Now I get 10.84. Now you could add these up across the top. Right, so I could go equals sum. I don't know why it's doing that. Hmm. Okay, sum these three things, close the parentheses, add them. And then I can copy this down. Boom. And 3.6 plus 7.2 is this. Or from the bottom, and you could use the sum equation, or you could just use this plus this. 
And you can do that for each of these or copy it across and it follows along quite nicely. And so what do we get? 0.8 plus 0.4 plus 9.6 again is this value. Now look, this is the sum of each of these relative errors, relative changes I should say. And so this is the test statistic. That is the test statistic. So this is the value that is distributed chi-squared. And we want to see, notice it's pretty big, we want to see if it's bigger than this test, this critical value. So here's my test statistic. If it's bigger than this critical statistic, then we have statistically significant evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. We reject the null hypothesis because this is so unlikely under the assumption of the null hypothesis. All right, so we look at this and we go, oh, that is bigger than this. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis and say that we have, uh, at a 0.01 significance level, uh, uh, evidence for the alternative hypothesis that the cure or no change or worse the things that happen, the results that happen, are dependent upon our choice of whether we use a brace or we use a surgery. And that's a big deal, because we're going to want to know which one we should go with. Okay? So it's time. Let's, let's, let's see here. Let's move over. I can move over one. Okay. So it's time to put um, our sentence, our final answer. So our test statistic is 10.8. I rounded it. You're right. While our critical score is 9.2, there it is, since our test statistic surpasses our critical score, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so I'm just telling you what we're doing, but the next sentence is more like what you would say to someone who's asked you to compute this out. So with a significance level of 0.01, we have substantial evidence, we have strong evidence that the results variable is dependent on the treatment variable. So you may want to know, okay, suppose our test statistic wasn't as big as our critical value, or what if it was a whole lot bigger? Well, in this case and in all cases, we might want the p-value. And what is the p-value? It's the probability of getting what you got or something more extreme assuming the null hypothesis. So what is the likelihood of getting a 10.8? Well, we, knew how, we know how to do that with the normal distribution, and we know how to do that with the t distribution. Can't we calculate that with other distributions? Absolutely. And I've typed in the formula right here, and it looks a lot like what you're used to. Now, what we want is to, we're going to actually give it a score, and it gives us an area. And that's what this true part is. On all these, we always type in true because we want a cumulative area. We're not giving it an area and it gives us a back a score. That uses the, the distribution dot INV. Here we're actually using the DIST function. Now, it's always the area to the left but chi, uh, for these functions, but chi squared is always about right tail test. It's always about the area to the right. So I want to go one minus this probability. So typing this in, uh, I go equals 1 minus chi squared dot dist, and then I put in the score. So there, I put in the score. I put in the degrees of freedom, which is 2 in this case, all right? And I always type true to get the probability. Boom. So we can say a little bit more. We can say that uh, the likelihood that assuming the null hypothesis, assuming that these variables are independent, the likelihood of getting this kind of level of differences that we got between the expected values and the observed values is 0.0044. So about four and a half out of a thousand times we would get something like this or worse assuming the null hypothesis. So it's kind of a twist to say, you don't want to say that's the probability 
of this just not being uh, this being correct or anything like that. We're just saying exactly what we're saying. We're saying exactly what we want to say. So in this case, we would reject the null hypothesis. And with more going back and taking the next class, that 212 and statistics or, or whatever class you go into where you're using this statistics, going in here and looking at these individual values to go deeper and observe, okay, so we know that it seems that whether we get a cure or things get worse or there's no change seems to be dependent upon which of the, the things we choose, a brace or a surgery. And so the bigger numbers flag the larger differences that we were seeing um, between the observed and the expected value. If you look over here, we were expecting with the brace to get 20 uh, people with using the brace of getting worse, but actually we got 12. While over here, we got 10 people in surgery we were expecting to get worse, but we actually saw 18. So these differences here are always positive, so they could be going up or down. But what we can do looking over here is, is that it seems that the one thing that we need to be careful of, and this is just you know, it, it, it's just me as a mass last stats person looking at this and just interpreting numbers. It seems to me that this is saying that when it comes to our choice about brace or surgery, the our, our expectations of things getting worse or higher, that we might need to change our expectations about uh, the chances that doing surgery, things could get worse because it seems here things did get almost twice as often worse than what we expected if this was just independent. Okay, so it's a nice little example. Um, we will do more. Hopefully you will read the, the, the section 10.2. I will have this as a new sheet and our kind of sheets of different tools that we'll use for confidence interval and hypothesis test. And uh, if you watch this, then that will allow me Friday to do a completely different example. All right. Hope you guys are being safe. I hope you're being good to each other. And I hope you're being good to yourself. And I hope that uh, you get to have lots more problems. Okay. Math problems, stats problems. All right. Bye-bye.